All too often in Buddhist circles, the problem of self and not self is treated as a logical issue. The idea of self is a logical fallacy. Self has to be permanent, but the things that we identify as self are impermanent. Therefore, if we notice that, and it's not hard to notice, we should kind of come to the conclusion that they're not self. We should let go of them. The problem with that approach is that your idea of self is not a logical conclusion. It's built bit by bit by bit, and actually you have many selves based on what you can control. There's a boundary. but It's a kind of fuzzy boundary between things you can and can't control. But there are enough things under your control that you want to hold on to them. Your body, your thoughts, feelings, your perceptions. Even your, especially your awareness. There's aspects here that you can control, and so you say they're useful for this and useful for that purpose, and holding on to them in this way or that way. I can get some happiness, and you identify with that happiness. And as we go through life, we pick up new tricks, new ways of finding happiness, and we stash them away, and they become part of our large committee inside. A lot of those ideas are, have their drawbacks. And we're going to see this as we start meditating, that there are certain things we identify with that are going to get in the way of following the path, doing the practice. And this is where the idea of not-self comes in handy. We can look at some of our old selves based around our old tricks. And instead of our old attitude, which is, well, I know I have, there are some drawbacks to the way I am, but that's just the way I am. I'm not about to change. An attitude that can get you through a lot in life, get you through school, get you through your occupation, family life. It begins to fall apart as you look more deeply for happiness, especially if you hear the, the teachings of the Four Noble Truths, that it is possible to put an end to suffering and find a genuine happiness, and that the cause comes from inside. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha taught not self to the five brethren after he taught them the Four Noble Truths. It's from that perspective you begin to look at your selves, all the old tricks you had for finding happiness, and begin to see that they're not really worth holding on to anymore. But at the same time, you don't let go of everything. Your desire for true happiness, something you want to hold on to. Your desire to follow the path correctly, something you want to hold on to as well. So what you're learning is new selves around new tricks. It's like teaching an old dog new selves. Because when you find that you have new ways of finding happiness, you can look back at your old ways and see that you know, they don't really work all that well, no matter how much you used to identify with them, hold on to them very tightly because of the things they could provide for you. You begin to look at the things that they provide, and say so they're not really worth it, all the drawbacks that those particular ways of engaging in the world might have. So think of the path as new sets of skills, and there's going to be, there are going to be new selves who, that develop around those sets of skills. And in the beginning they're pretty weak, and your old selves come barging in. And say, I want this, I want that, I want the old ways of doing things. And this is where your conviction and the path will come in handy. Conviction in the fact that the Buddha was awakened, he found a way to awakening by abandoning his old selves. Now there will come a point, of course, where you don't need any sense of self. That's when you've found that true happiness. But up to that point, you will need new senses of self. And what we're doing is raising the bar, getting more selective in what kind of happiness we find really satisfactory. And then the ways you used to judge your old selves can be seen as wanting. Because the happiness they could provide does have its drawbacks, and the ways that go about it can often have its drawbacks.
But at the same time, you really do have to develop these new selves through developing the new tricks, the new strategies of finding happiness through, through the meditation, through being generous, being virtuous. You want to develop new senses of self around that, and it's going to be awkward for a while, because a lot of us are old dogs. And that applies not only to the people who up in their 60s or 70s or 80s. And once you hit 20, you've pretty much, for most people, set up your senses of self. And there are a lot of people who stop growing from that point on. And some people stop growing even earlier than that. It's that attitude, well, this is the way I am, I'm not going to change, because I'm perfectly satisfied with the results I get. Even though I can see that they have drawbacks, I'm still satisfied with what I've got. You've got to raise your attitude, raise your sense of what kind of happiness is possible, and what kind of skills are going to be required for that new happiness. And here the sense of self that is confident that, yes, I can do this, is going to come in handy. I've known people who started meditating in their 70s, 80s, and have actually done quite well. Because it's not a matter of physical age, it's a matter of the age of your attitude. The old dog attitude starts whenever you say, okay, I can't learn any new tricks. I'm not about to learn any new selves and new ways of doing things. That can develop at any age, but it also can be abandoned at any age. It does get harder as you get older. So the best time to start it, creating new skills and having new senses of selves around those skills is right now. But see, it's that. Don't see, I've got this ego that it's really bad, I've got to get rid of this ego. Learn to take it apart into all the different selves that go into it, and see which ones are useful and which ones are not. If you have a unitary ego, it's going to be hard for it to take itself apart. But you realize, okay, this is a committee job. Different of the members of the committee have different skills, different abilities. Try to sort through them, see which ones are actually useful on the path. Back when I was in school, I was studying Augustine for a while. One of the lessons I learned about him was that he, once he was converted to Christianity, he decided, well, he wasn't going to throw away his skills that he had developed prior to his Christian life. He was going to convert them to a new purpose. Centuries after Voltaire went through the Christian tradition, had the same attitude. He said it's a dunghill strewn with diamonds. He was going to pick out the diamonds. In other words, when you have a new purpose, you can go back and look at your old skills and choose which ones are actually going to be helpful for the new purpose and which ones are not. It's the way with any conversion, conversion process, and this applies not only to people who are not raised as Buddhists, but often people who are raised as Buddhists suddenly find themselves, when they actually practice, they have to throw away a lot of their earlier attitudes. So you sort through your stable of selves, or your closet of different, different uniforms or different disguises you've been wearing. See which ones are going to be useful on the path. Hold on to those, develop those, and learn how to regard as not-self the ones that are going to get, get in the way. And then as you learn new tricks, you find you're not an old dog anymore. You've got new skills, and you have a new sense of who you are around those skills. It's all to the good. There will come a point, of course, when you don't even need that sense of self. But don't be in a hurry to throw away all your senses of selves. Some of them have their purposes. But at the same time, learn how to look at your old selves that are not useful. You realize no matter how much I may have identified with these things in the past, no matter, no matter how much satisfaction I got out of acting in those ways, I've got to say goodbye. And that's what not self is. It's a value judgment. 
just as self is a value judgment, what things are worth holding on to, which things are not worth holding on to. You've got to change your standards of judgment. And so only in that way you're going to be able to make progress in the path. And you might ask, who is this for? And the Buddha never really answers that question. He said, let go of what is not yours. It will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. There's a paradox in there. But as John Swad used to say, once you find that ultimate welfare and happiness, it's so complete, so total, and because it requires no actions at all. You don't have to ask who did this or who's experiencing this. The happiness is sufficient in and of itself, and that's all that matters. which is a value judgment as well.